This is a very self-shushing crowd. I like this. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Shannon Ozerny. I am the head of youth services at the West Vancouver Memorial Library, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event called Finding Your Way. We are so pleased that you all have joined us here this morning, and this event is also being live streamed to classrooms across the province and beyond. So hello to all of us, all of you who are joining us from afar. The Vancouver Writers Fest carries out its work and this event today on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. To start things off, we have a message from Chief Ian Campbell of the Squamish Nation. Hi everybody, it's an honor to welcome you to another year of Vancouver's Writers Fest. My name is Chief Ian Campbell, I'm from the Squamish Nation. It's an honor to welcome you to the shared territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh families. We are here on Granville Island, next to our ancient village of Snop. We're gonna have an awesome year. Welcome everybody, Poichita Osiem. Before we begin, I just have a few notes to deliver. First, please silence your phone during this event. You do not wanna be that person who did not silence their phone. Uh, later this evening, you will also receive a feedback survey by email about this event. Please take a moment to complete it and share your thoughts. The festival relies on your feedback to make events better every year and festival staff reads all the comments. Following the event, there will also be book sales and a signing with all of our authors in the venue lobby. And I also want to say a huge thank you to all the volunteers and festival supporters, especially our title sponsor, CMHC Granville Island, and all of our government funders. And this year, the festival bookstore is located at the end of Cartwright Street in the Origins Coffee location. So how is this going to work today? I'm very shortly going to be introducing you to our presenters. They are each gonna take a few minutes up here at the podium to tell you about their latest books to kind of ground our conversation. Then the four of us will be chatting up here and we're gonna leave the last 10 or 15 minutes so or so for your questions. So if you have those, please hang on to them and we do really want to hear from you. So first, it is my pleasure to introduce Michelle Katarusman. If you ask me to describe Michelle as a writer, I'd say she's someone who truly believes in the power of young activists, diverse representation, and thoughtfully portraying different places and people in her several critically acclaimed and award-winning novels. She has been a finalist for the Governor General's Award and the Silver Birch Award, and her latest book, We the Sea Turtles, is a propulsive short story collection about nine kids, all linked by a turtle. It is inspirational and comforting, and it doesn't shy away from some of the big challenges that we face growing up in today's world. If you haven't read it yet, I can't wait for you to do so. And please help me give a warm festival welcome to Michelle Katarusman. Thank you for that beautiful introduction, Shannon. That was so lovely. And thanks. Hi, everybody. Thanks all for coming. It's so wonderful to be here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my new book, We the Sea Turtles. It is a collection of short stories. Each is set on a different island around the world, and each deals with a different environmental theme. Uh, there's also sea turtles who swim throughout the stories, uh, swim through the pages, and at the very end of the collection, there is an epilogue that is written from the sea turtle's point of view, and that is what I'm going to read for you now. After a lifetime of adventure, I turn towards home. I've been on an epic journey so many thousands of miles ago that I forget when I started, but I know that it's time for me to go home, back to my homeland, back to the beach where I hatched with hundreds of my brothers and sisters, where we sand crawled on our tiny flippers to the safety of the ocean waves within hours of breaking through our soft eggshells. Most of us didn't make it. Snatched by gulls, crabs, and furred land animals. But under the waves, the long seaweed grasses, there was refuge from the many predators. I clung to my underwater 
garden nibbling on mollusks and tiny fish, growing bigger and bigger until I was strong enough to swim out into the open ocean. In the vast oceans and seas of the world, I learned to fly underwater, swift and silent like a liquid shadow. With the currents and moonlight as my guides, I was an explorer, wild and free. I journeyed to faraway shores to find the most delicious jellyfish. Oh, jellyfish. It might not look like sea turtles speak to each other, but we do. We signal danger. We mourn for those lost. We celebrate new life. We sing our warnings, our joys, our fears. Our songs are deep vibrations in the oceans where we have existed for millions of years, long before humans ever appeared. We, the sea turtles, belong to all the oceans. We embody all that you see when you gaze into their mysterious waters. We are beauty, we are freedom, we are adventure. We take care of the ocean seaweed beds, fish population, and the coral reefs. We keep the waters of the world healthy, which is important not just for those of us who live in their depths, but for all living creatures. We, the sea turtles, are ancient stewards of our planet. As I swim towards home now, I wonder, what will I find when I arrive? Will my beach home still be there? Will new life be nesting in the sand, safe from harm? Will my baby brothers and sisters find safety in the seaweed gardens as I once did? What will I find when I finally return home from my long, long journey? Because I'm sending you this message, and because I'm old, I will dare to hope for the answer that I want, and that is that love will be waiting. All right, I'm thrilled to introduce our next speaker, A.T. Woodley. I don't think you will read anything like A.T. Woodley's The Boy Who Woke the Sun ever in your life, and that is a compliment. What starts out with a kid named Elliot having a fairly lonely pandemic summer quickly turns into one of the most original, fast-paced, and inventive fantasy quests it's hard to believe this is his first novel, but it is, and it has just been nominated for a Silver Birch Reader's Choice Award. Let's all give a hearty festival welcome to A.T. Woodley. Okay, hi everybody. How you doing? Good. Hello to all the live streamers out there. Um, so, uh, when I was growing up, my favorite books were always fantasy adventures. Um, the kind where the main character, who's always a kid or a group of kids, is transported to another reality or world. Um, books like, you know, classics like um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, or A Wrinkle in Time, which you have, if you haven't read, I highly recommend. Or um, Canadian books like um, the Secret World of Og and Jacob Tutu meets the Hooded Fang. All of these books really excited me. Even Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which I'm sure you all know, you know, when Charlie enters that chocolate factory, it's just like he's entering into this entirely different magical realm. And I, I think um, part of the reason I loved those books so much was that it something about those worlds really allowed the authors to, um, you know, let their imaginations roam free. Just set it free and let it go wherever it pleased. And there's a real inherent sort of joy to that, I think, when you're reading. And, um, and I always wanted to try writing one of those books, and I did. Um, it's called The Boy Who Woke the Sun, as mentioned. And um, it's about a boy, um, uh, 11-year-old boy named Elliot, who is um, sort of dealing with um, trying to figure out who he is and this sense of what he should be in life. And he's really struggling with um, you know, what's, what's most important to him and what, what truly matters in this, in this life. And he's looking at the big picture of the world and, and, and trying to figure out how he fits in it. And uh, at the time, there's a pandemic going on. Some of you remember that. Um, and so he's feeling quite isolated and alone and, um, and quite a bit vulnerable, too, because he's realizing the world is very 
a very fragile place, and that one really needs to respect um, nature and protect the environment. And um, so in the midst of all this, he's transported to another reality, as I was saying, and he meets a talking, walking octopus there. Um, and uh, they have to travel through a world called Lepanthia that is plagued by dark, demonic butterflies that fly into your soul and make you feel so sad you want to lie down and never get back up again. Unless you know what makes you truly happy, what sparks that joy in you and lights your soul. And Elliot does not know what that is. He has to find that out if he's ever to make it through Lepanthia and find his way home. So that is uh, the story in a nutshell. And I will read you some of it now. Um, all right. Oh, this is, uh, so Elliot and the octopus have just met uh, in this world. They were just chased by butterflies for the first time. And uh, just as the butterflies were about to attack them, they fell through the forest floor and were rescued by a couple of kids. Uh, one of them named Ronan, one of them named Q, and they're in an underground tunnel on their way to somewhere called the Magical, the Underground Kingdom, sorry. Yes, I wrote this, here we go. Okay, they marched until they came to a drop-off where the tunnel arced downward and no further torches lit the way. The children pulled knapsacks from out from under their cloaks and threw them into a rusty old mining cart that was sitting nearby. The cart was mounted on tracks that plunged steeply into the dark. They're not getting into that thing, said the octopus, are they? Sure enough, Ronan picked Q up and placed her in the cart. Yep, they're getting into that thing, the octopus answered himself. Don't worry, it's safe, said Ronan, as he pulled a lever, releasing the cart toward the incline. Are you coming, Elliot said to the octopus. I am not getting into that thing. Yes, you are, said Elliot, grabbing his friend by the tentacles and scrambling into the cart just as it took off down the tracks. They shot through the dark, wind in their hair, glowing crystals whizzing by. The octopus screamed loudly, sounding like a cross between a dental drill and a crying baby. As the cart barreled down the rails, turning corners at breakneck speed, the tracks curved up, then down, then up again, passing through caverns where bats hung from stalactites and waterfalls sprayed mist into the air. Elliot howled with delight, losing himself in the excitement of it all. This is amazing, he screamed, having more fun than he'd had in a long while. No, it's not, the octopus screamed back. The cart rounded a corner, and up ahead, Elliot saw something truly terrifying come into view. A solid wall at the end of the tracks. They were going so fast, they wouldn't be able to slow down in time. They were going to crash. We're going to die, the octopus screamed, and then fainted in Elliot's arms. Elliot steeled himself, shutting his eyes and leaning forward to protect the octopus. But rather than crashing, the cart burst through. The wall was just a curtain of hanging vines. They entered an enormous cave filled with hundreds of children, running, leaping, kicking balls, jumping ropes, and swinging from vines tied to the ceiling, hundreds of feet above. A water slide built of of old mining equipment looped from one end of the cave to the other, launching a queue of squealing children into a lagoon, and a collective roar of joy filled the place. Elliot couldn't believe his eyes. He nudged the octopus. Wake up! You have to see this! The octopus came to. Uh, where, where am I? Is that a cake shop? said Elliot, pointing to a room carved into the rock where kids were busy baking cupcakes and brownies, placing them on a countertop for ca uh, passers-by to grab, some of whom rode scooters. Cinnamon and sweet butter filled the air, and everywhere you looked, there was rock climbing. It was pure magic. The place filled him with a sense of wonder, and for a moment, Elliot forgot that he was lost in another world, far from home. For a moment, all he knew was he was happy. They hopped out and followed the boy through the crowds of scruffy-looking children, many of whom were wearing tattered clothes. Some were even wearing bedsheets and rags, and most looked like they hadn't combed their hair or brushed their teeth in a long time. Judging from the smell, many hadn't bathed in a while either. Despite all appearances, however, they seemed cheerful. There wasn't a mope or scowl among them. Elliot, the octopus, and Ronan entered a tunnel with rows of alcoves on either side. Each alcove had been transformed into a candle-lit room with a different theme. The mud room, the slime room, the glitter room, the room of balls, the room of ruining things, 
and the ultimate room, the room of mud, slime, glitter balls, and ruining things. It was like walking down a street where every shop was the greatest in the world. The tunnel led to a secondary cave wherein several campfires burned. Ronan stopped and pointed to a bouncy castle where an old woman was jumping, surrounded by laughing children. That's her, he said, Granny Yilba. There you go. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our final author, Alan Verilaro. While Alan has just published his first novel with Candlewick Press, Where the Water Takes Us, he has been telling stories that you have probably seen in another medium for decades. He's the Academy Award-winning writer and director of the animated short film Piper, and has been supervising animator on many other popular theatrical releases, including The Incredibles, Incredibles 2, WALL-E, and Brave. As a librarian, I am selfishly very excited for everyone to discover Alan's beautiful, tender, and thoughtful writing style in book form. So please help me give a very warm festival welcome to Alan Barilero. Thanks, everybody. see if this works. I, I would like to share a quick story. Um, in grade one, I had to read in front of the class. And I don't know about anybody here. I was terrified. I'm, I'm not one who wants to read in front of the class, so I'm not going to do it today. But I have a great excuse. I got up in front of the class, and I, uh, I had learned to read backwards, and I hadn't told anybody yet. And I got up there, and instead of like saying, you know, the cat in the house, I said, girl, I gloop, gloop, gloop. And that means the cat uh, walked into the house. And everybody laughed, and I was super embarrassed. Um, so if you're scared to read in front of the class, um, you're looking at one who's absolutely terrified. So I'm not going to read in front of you, but I, ple I hope you don't mind my nervousness. Instead, I'd like to talk quickly about my book and just skip through um, the type of stories I like to tell and give you a little bit of making of, of the work behind a novel or a film. So um, I'll start with this quick quote, which is, wildness reminds us of what it means to be human and what we are connected to rather than what we're separated from. And that, in a nutshell, starts off the epigraph for my novel, but also the type of stories I like to tell. Um, whether it's Piper or this novel, I love how nature teaches us things and, and teaches us to grow. And uh, there's so many life lessons to our connections with nature. These are some sketches from um, the novel where there's birds. And yes, I like birds. You guys have me call that. I draw a lot of birds. Um, here's a little quick snap of what the book might look like if it was a film that we're kind of working. So shh, don't tell anybody, but we're kind of quietly working on these things. And maybe this is the characters. Um, so how does all this, like, what I would love to say today is all these ideas that we work on, they all look finished. When I was a kid and I wanted to be an author or uh, work in film, I'm like, how could I begin to do that? And I guess I'm here today to kind of explain from our point of view is it's all this hard work, it's, it's all these layers, and it takes years. Uh, Piper took me three years to make. Um, this novel took me, I don't even know if I can count, maybe six or seven years. Um, everything's iteration if you love to tell stories, and you can't be afraid. So what does it start? It starts always with the sketchbook. You know, I have one in my pocket right now. I thought I'd take some pictures of my sketchbooks and go, well, how, does, how do I write? How did I? I don't know, I just scribble and I draw and I go, well, that's a funny idea. Um, this, if you can read my chicken scratch, that's me asking the question, how much, uh, how much you know, humor can I get out of the feathers for Piper when I'm just thinking of the story? And if you look over the corner, it says Crown Land, that's me maybe 10, well, six years ago writing the beginnings of what will be this novel, Where the Water Takes Us. Um, and then it, I, well, well, I start exploring, well, what does feathers look like on a film? You know, how can Wally do that? Or sorry, Wally. I worked on that film too, so I get confused. Um, how can this silly bird, you know, what does it mean to be scared and vulnerable? Um, so when I think of the novel, it's the same thing. You know, I start with a map um, because I don't know what <laughs> I'm trying to tell a story and it really is believable to me. So where is everything? And I'm constantly moving around that map. No, that island needs to be over here. Um, but there's lots of mistakes and there's lots of people to help you on the way. You know, drawing and painting and editors and this whole group is helping you tell your story, um, but you get there. Um, so I'm showing you like all, the, all the, the messiness of it, and hopefully that 
you know, here's Piper and some really bad ideas of things I came up with. It's like I had this idea that eating worms was really cool because that's what they do. And it was so gross. It was so gross we had to stop and cut it out of the film. Or, you know, what if he was a surfer? Here's a little deleted scene of, of Piper running around. But I, again, it's, it's the process, I guess, is what I'm trying to explain. It's a, it's a searching for you to tell the, the best story possible. Um, if I was, you know, I told myself I'm going to write a novel, I want it to be a flip book because every book I had as a kid, I made a flip book. Um, here's some paintings from that, and this is the novel. If you flip through my book, you'll get a little bird flying up and down. And not knowing how to make a novel before this, I didn't realize that every time you do an edit and you add a new page, you have to redraw and retime out birds flying on them. So <laughs> things you learn making a book. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a sketchbook. This, this, what you're looking at here is probably uh, three or four books in my head and not more, all in different pages. And I'll give a sneak peek of a book that won't even be my next novel, will be the one after that. Um, it's a story of a little animal that I'm not gonna give it away, but has to go into the mountains. And a lot of what I do, I draw to my personal life. So these are the, ma the, the magical, misty mountains that they're going into. But locally, you might realize that might be North Vancouver. Might be, you know, if you're watching a baseball game and your kid in Delbrook Park, you might, might be sketching something like this. So it always has this personal touch. But thank you, thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, talk more. We've reached the chatting portion. Chat. Finally. <laughs> All right, finding your way. How do you find it? What do you do? No. Um, I always just like to start by asking about the very first little germ or seed of your latest book. Whether you were in the grocery store or you had a weird dream or you ate some bad shrimp. Michelle, could you start and tell us a little bit? It's such a unique format, your book. You've got nine short stories that are linked by this turtle. Where did you first get the inkling about We the Sea Turtles? I'm lucky enough to um, be invited by friends to their cottage on a very tiny island in Georgian Bay. And um, I'm used to much lusher landscapes than Georgian Bay. It's very windswept. And when you get to this island, which is tiny, it's just basically a collection of boulders. And when I went there the first time, I was like, wow, like, where am I? Um, but then when you look deeper, you see so much the layers of all the beauty and sort of the wind swept landscape and these huge skies. And I was, I was just completely enchanted by it. And the hosts were taking me a walk around the island and they pointed out the curled up uh, remains of this, uh, maybe a little animal, probably a little fox, and uh, the bones were so perfectly uh, formed. And it was, the imagery really stayed with me, and it was a, a location that, as a writer, I couldn't help but want to set a story. And that was, um, I wrote the first story of this collection called Fox Bones in this setting. And then it just, I just kind of leapfrogged my way from island to island, uh, different places in the world that have, uh, have had a real impact on me. And it made sense to make it a collection. And I thought a wonderful way of, of connecting the collection was to have a sea turtle swimming through um, to impart, a, a, like, kind of like a talisman, uh, imparting a little bit of their, their ancient sea turtle wisdom to, to all the young uh, protagonists in the story. Um, yeah, but it was definitely that moment in Georgian Bay um, and that imagery and being immersed in nature that, that started the seed of the collection. And Aaron, I can't begin to imagine <laughs> what your entry point was to this world. Yeah. Well, you know, the answer is there were a few. Uh, I'll talk about one. Uh, one comes to mind. Um, so when, I, when my, my daughter Penelope was, I, I started writing this book five years ago. And um, around that time, we had just moved to Victoria, actually. And um, 
I was putting her to bed. We used to play this game when I put her to bed, and I would say, okay, give me a thing, an animal, and a place. Uh, and then I will tell you a story. She used to call this, tell me a story from your mouth, Daddy. From your mouth, not from a book, you see. From my mouth, just make it up. And so I'd say, okay, well, give me something. And we would do this each night, kind of like an improv story thing. Sometimes I'd have her do that back as well. But um, anyway, one night she gave me an octopus, the ocean, and a trampoline. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. What do I do with this? And I thought, okay, so there, I told her this story about a little octopus who uh, popped his head up from the shore and saw a little girl on the shore jumping on a trampoline. And he thought, wow, I want to do that. That looks amazing. So he waited for the girl to go to sleep with her family, and he snuck out of the ocean, and he took her boots, you know, because how does, a, how does an octopus jump on a trampoline? So he took her boots, and he wove his tentacles together like a braid, you know? So he's got four tentacles braided into one leg, four tentacles braided into another, and he slips, slips the tentacles into the boots, and he starts having the time of his life, an octopus jumping on a trampoline. And I thought, okay, well, there's the story. And, um, and that sort of stayed with me. I was like, I really like that character. I think, you know, there's something there. I've, I've never seen an octopus who loves jumping on a trampoline before with boots. Like puss in boots, you know, but octopus in boots. And so, um, so I said, okay, well, that, there's something there, and I'd like to see it. And, and, and he just, that sort of started the whole thing off, you know. Uh, when, I, when I decided to start writing a book, I think it was the next day or so, I was like, this octopus has to be in there. And he is. He's a, he's a huge part of it. So. And Alan, how did you know you had a book and not a film? <laughs> That's a great question. Did you know? I don't ever really know. I, you know, it's one of those things like, you know, when you're in art class and you're like, well, I have a, I have a brush. I have a, what should I do? Should I use a pencil? Should I use... And, and you start playing around and it starts... In a way, the story starts telling you what it should be. And it just felt like it should be more of a novel uh, as a starting place. So, uh, yeah, you kind of you kind of react and watch. Um, you know, books allow you to say, I want to be closer to the character, so I naturally... I'll admit, I was scared to be an author. That's really the truth of it. And I always lean to film. And, and being a writer is, is very vulnerable. It's, you can't go, if you imagine us all in a movie, we go, well, we all made this project, so you know, um, it's not totally me if you don't like it. Uh, with a book, it's like, oh no, <laughs> like, it's me. Your name so, is right yeah. there. Yeah. I want to add a lot of names to it and say hi, hi to hide a little bit. It's, um, yeah, but yeah, it took some courage actually. My editor convinced me of it, so it. she's like, I think you have a novel. Um, so I, I owe it to her. One thing I was thinking of, you know, especially reading all three of your books together, were you all the kinds of kids who would throw like elaborate funerals for any dead animal you found on the ground? <laughs> the pause is worrying me. Uh, <laughs> You as know, much as you I, feel comfortable sharing. So, so I have a little monologue from Elliot in, in the book where he talks about, um, I, and I used to do this too. I mean, you know, if I ever saw a bee in a pool, I don't know if you guys do this, if you see a bee, you're going to scoop it up, take it out. You know, even if it might sting you, you're going to try and save that bee. I used to, when I was walking on the sidewalk, I'd look where I was walking so I didn't step on any ants, you know, that kind of thing. So I was very much a... Uh, uh, an animal lover, I guess, of, of uh, you know, growing up. Uh, I, I can't recall any funerals, though, but that's, uh, I'd like to hear. I have my characters in the story have um, a funeral for the said fox bones that I talked about earlier. And I think I do remember as a child uh, lots of uh, shoe boxes and... Um, Match boxes? Yeah. Well, shoe boxes for the birds and then yeah, at some point having to do something more with the shoebox. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, as a ceremony, I think I'm obviously a nature lover, animal lover, and I think it's, I think it's really a lovely thing to do as a ceremony to acknowledge, you know, when, when the characters in my story notice that they have uh, the bones of it was a living animal to put this animal to rest, and it has a great meaning for them mm -hmm. to, to go through that ceremony. And, you know, with that meaning, too, Alan, in your book, Ava almost becomes over-invested in um, sort of the plight of these birds around her to the, to the point where she begins to, to feel they, they'll have an impact on the course of her life. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was definitely that kid that um, I, my imagination would just take over. And I would really believe um, it would come from some anxiety of like, wow, that, that, that's a really thing. So the character feels she's cursed and has every reason to feel that way. I don't know if you ever feel that way. You're like, oh man, I, I feel like that's going to happen. Uh, that's, that's definitely Ava and it's definitely a, a little, little part of me <laughs> and how I, I react. I'm also sort of related to that, wondering a little bit about um, your stance on hope. And there is this idea um, that sort of the younger the audience, the more hope a book has to have. Um, and I guess maybe Alan, going back to you and, and thinking about Ava and her family circumstances, her, her mom is having some health issues. Was there a version of your book or your story that contained less hope? Yeah, you know, my stories start, uh, you know, what's great about I, being a middle grade author is kids don't lie, my kids don't, and when the story doesn't work, you lose your audience. They'll, they'll be the first to say, no way, I don't believe that. So you instantly have to be truthful. Um, you know, we'll all just shut the book and go, no, not buying it. So um, it's like being faced with the most honest audience ever. And I remember this from my Pixar days. We'd go to a theater and we'd watch and go, okay, I thought that was a good piece of animation, but it's, the crowd has spoken. Um, so uh, that honesty, I guess, uh, is means, you know, to me, in, in all seriousness, I like um, stories that are truthful. And that, I care, and that Ava's dealing with some anxiety, and that's very honest to me and very truthful. And I want to represent that in an honest way and have hope, but also portray that side. Michelle, for you too, your, your characters are dealing with like some eco anxiety and like big, massive things where it can be really hard to find hope. And you're working with these short stories, which is a very demanding format, where you're not having to wrap up a story in 10 or 12 pages, but bring some sort of closure. Did you find it challenging to balance these big issues and some sense of hopefulness or, or closure in each of these little mini narratives? I love writing middle grade. I mean, you young readers are all very intelligent readers. You're all sophisticated readers, and you're also reading at an age now where we are, we can look out at the world and we can feel idealistic and positive and know that we can make a difference. And that's the kind of tone that I like to, to set my stories, that um, we can empower ourselves um, with, we tell each other short stories all the time, like just to, exp what did you do at school? How was your day? We're constantly communicating with each other through these little mini short stories. And this having a collection, I found to be, it was such a fantastic creative experience for me because I could kind of drop in to um, a character and their setting and, and then I could sort of pop out again. And it, it allowed me to sort of build, build these, these worlds. Um, but I didn't have to get uh, mired in all the backstory and what was going to happen. I could just describe a moment uh, in their lives. And I, but I, I would have, in terms of, of hope, I think that comes from, from you guys because, you know, at the reading age of middle grade, we all know that we can make a big difference. Even small, uh, small actions, we know that are going to make a big difference. Karen, was, was there any part of Boy Who Woke the Sun that you're like, no, this is too weird or dark or... <laughs> I was constantly thinking that. <laughs> the whole time I was writing it, I was like, this should be more like Harry Potter. It should be more fun. This is too weird and dark. No one's going to read this. But um, no, I mean, you know, middle grade audiences, like any audience, you know, I mean, um, you, you, can, you can write about dark strange things and I think everyone has a little dark strange in them and they appreciate that and you shouldn't shy away from it and um, you know I speaking of middle writing for middle grade you know I didn't really set out to write a middle grade book it's just the story that happened 
I'm sure it had something to do with the, with the octopus and the trampoline, but it, 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 you know, the middle grade books, I think, were the ones that really stuck with me most through my life. I think the books I read when I was your age, even the movies I saw, are the ones that really affected me on a deep level, I think. Um, and I think it's because, you know, you're at an age where you're very open, and um, there, is, there aren't a lot of filters that have been put on there, as, uh, as can happen as you, as you grow older. And so um, it's a fan, you're a fantastic audience to write for. And I don't know if I'm ever going to write anything other than middle grade at this point, but um, because it is a whole lot of fun also just to get into that headspace and, and be, be your age and really try to um, tap into that imagination you all have. And something related to kind of figuring this all out and finding your way, um, Michelle, in the first story in your book, we meet Selma, and um, in Foxbones, that story you were telling us about. And Selma says, and I love this phrase, she loves going to the island in the summer because she is allowed to retreat into the self that made her most happy, her alone self. And this idea of an alone self and this, this person we exist as when we're only alone. And I guess I'm wondering, for all three of you, how does your alone self function in your creativity? Do you, are you a recluse while you're in storytelling mode? Are you desperately needing to send out chapters or pages to get feedback on? Where, how does being alone with your thoughts um, factor into your process? I miss my alone self. I have a toddler. My alone self is gone forever, I think, but. It's gonna be a while. <laughs> When I wrote um, that about Selma, it was, you know, definitely um, a fantasy for me <laughs> to be able to retreat into my alone self. And um, I, I'm an introvert. I, I, I do prefer to be alone. Um, and when I'm creatively, definitely. And I think I can't imagine being able to do that otherwise. Um, I spend a lot of time walking in nature, uh, walking preferably with a dog, not completely alone. And that's where I really get my ideas, when I'm walking in nature and when I'm able to just let my mind free. And I'll often have sort of fully formed um, stories before I start committing it to a computer. But I, I need, when I've spent time with a lot of people like, like this, I will need to spend time then for myself alone to to really recharge and process it and um, sort of to recharge my battery again. So I definitely rely on on being alone for my for my process. Alan, in animation there's a whole team. Were you lonely doing this book? I, I, I was very lonely. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, you know, I'm uh, I'll, I'll admittedly, you know the kid in the class who tries to sit way in the back and not answer like I was very good at trying to hide my, a lot of my work was trying to line with the other kids so no one the teacher wouldn't see me inevitably would see me and then I would be drawing quite a bit um, in my own head so that that, that kind of animation was I love to act but I'm scared to be on stage and uh, but if I'm a, a fish or a monster you know it's not me it's just that monster so it took a lot of confidence to eventually um, be willing to like you know, write a book or do something where you're, you're talking in front of people. Yeah, who wants to talk in front of people, right? It's a scary, it's a, it's a scary thing. <laughs> Who's with me? I mean, <laughs> the ones who are with you, are, they're not, they don't want to draw attention to themselves. <laughs> That's, That's the right. thing. Because you can switch places with me and I, I can sit down. <laughs> Aaron, take us inside your alone self. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> Here it, we go, it, everybody. Is everybody. it just <laughs> Lepanthia, like verbatim? <laughs> No, well, you know, I, um, so, well, I'll say that, you know, I need quiet when I'm, quiet, everyone. No, I need quiet when I'm uh, writing. And uh, just, you know, to really sort of uh, go into that internal space and really be honest about it and tap into it. I can't, I can't work in a, in a big, uh, noisy environment. And, um, you know, both Alan and I were in, um, we're filmmakers, art filmmakers, and, um, you know, I, the experience is so different, right? Because when you're making a film, you've got so many people involved. You've got more people involved than are in this room, probably by, by 10, yeah. right? 
And half of them want to tell you what you should be doing, right? <laughs> and, they, and they should be telling you you should be doing the exact opposite of what you're doing. And everybody has an opinion, and they're trying to pull and pu push and pull you in all sorts of different directions. And, and it's really hard to navigate, really hard, to come out the other end with a story that you still feel is the story you wanted to tell in the beginning. And um, so this really suits me well. I like this. I like the writing thing because there's just you. There's just you and the keyboard and quiet. And you can write your story exactly the way you want it to be told. And you, you, it's really uncompromising. And not, not, not to mention, you got the biggest budget in the world. It's unlimited, right? I mean, you can go to as many planets as you want. The movie you can head. have as many monsters and extra, you know, crowds of millions if you want. So it's... Um, it, you know, writing is really fantastic that way, and I think um, I think it's the solitary nature of it that really makes it so special for me. I was always very um, envious of, of 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 musicians, you know, or or painters who would, you know, they'd paint exactly the way they wanted to paint, and I always felt that filmmaking was like you're painting, and you have like ten hands on the brush, and you're all trying to put the brush that should go up here, you know, it's not you. And I just wanted the brush to be my own. I don't want, you know, and that's, it's, it's great. I highly recommend it for anyone who's um, thinking of being a writer. Film too, film's great. Just very different kind of thing, so be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> Group projects versus individual projects. Yeah, that's right. I have lots more questions, but I want to make sure that we have time to hear from all of you. Um, basically, how it works is you throw up your hand, I squint into the darkness, and you yell out your question. Being the first person to do this is harrowing. Um, but if anybody feels like being the first person to do it, uh, the throw your hand up and I will uh, see if there's anyone feeling that yet. Oh, do I see one? One in the center. Perfect. Yeah, do you want to stand up and uh, shout your question to the rafters? And or, I will make sure to repeat it. it for everyone in our live stream audience. Oh, how do you get rid of writer's block? Aaron okay. had to actually massage his brain. I, for a yeah, <laughs> I do this to get my brain moving. Uh, you know, one day, caffeine helps, you know, some coffee. It's amazing how much inspiration can come from too much coffee. Um, you know, uh, so, yeah, that is a good question, eh? Uh, a, a walk in nature can sometimes clear your head. I think, I bet, I mean, you know, any, anything meditative, I think, you know, because often what writer's block is, is you've got all this noise inside your head. You know, you, you, what you want to say is in there. You just can't access it. So you've got to clear away all the clouds and cobwebs to get to it. So whatever you can do, meditation, walk, caffeine. I, um, and, you know, and, and also just, um, just sit there. Just sit there and uh, don't give up. Like sometimes, you know, it may take a half an hour, an hour for you to, to crack the code of what it is you're, you're trying to do uh, or the idea you're trying to get at, but it's there and just, just keep at it. Michelle, I wanna hear, I wanna hear all of your, we oh, need yeah? as many writer block I mean, tips as we can get. For me, it's, I do a lot of stories at the same time. It's actually a, a thing I learned at Pixar that you don't do more than, uh, the rule is like three films at the same time. Lots of ideas. I move on to the next one. That's uh, so I kind of work on like three or four books all at the same time. Five, really, if I'm being honest. And I jump around, and when I get stuck, I go to the other story, and I go, oh, "I figured out the solution on that one because I just needed to walk away from it." Um, but less coffee, more boba. My kids got me hooked on boba now, <laughs> just to stay on the caffeine. There's a, a really magical thing that happens when you put away a story that you're working on. And you put it away and you, and you leave it to kind of percolate on its own. And you might come back to it in two weeks, three weeks, and you will reread it in a completely different perspective. And that is a really helpful tool uh, when, you're, when you're having run. It's a similar kind of thing. You just, if it's, if it's too hard, don't, don't try and push it. Just put it away. Uh, maybe work on something else, or maybe take that walk in nature with the dog. Uh, grab that coffee. Um, I don't start really. drinking coffee. I, I didn't, oh, you know, yeah. that's not. Um, but time is a magical component uh, when it comes to writing. The Writer's Fest does not condone more than 30 milligrams of caffeine unless you're 18 or older. Yes. Uh, <laughs> any other questions? Yes, you right there in the white hoodie. Do you want to stand? Oh, white hoodie, and then I'll go to you right after. 
Favorite color. Can we, you know what? I'm going to make this crazier. Okay. What that is was, your was... main character's favorite color? I want to, okay, your favorite colors, and, your, and I want to know Ava, Elliot, and maybe Selma's favorite color. Okay. Ah, uh, this is a hard, you know, this drives my kids crazy because I refuse to pick a favorite color. It depends on my mood, and then they get mad at me. I'm that person that uh, I would say it's a slate blue right now. Maybe tomorrow it might be green. Um, what would Ava's favorite color be in Where Water Takes It definitely wouldn't be red. And if you no. read the book, you'll know why. Um, uh, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's, I think a purple. She feels like purple to me. Purple. Um, Elliot loves the ocean. So I'm going to say pink. <laughs> I mean blue. Blue. He loves there, blue. Elliot loves blue. There was actually a, a line that I had to take out of the story uh, that I was always disappointed. And it was that Selma's eyes reflected the slate blue color of the lake. And I can't remember why we had to take it out, but now I get to share it with all of you. So slate blue. Three blue. Yeah. Oh my Three God, blue. this is like a moment right all now. All blue. <laughs> we both like slate blue. Uh, and then I think you had a question. Uh, yes, go ahead. How many roughs? Rough drafts, yeah. When you're thinking about your question. latest books, how many drafts? I don't know if you want to measure that in number of drafts or time. Up to you. Who's going first? Oh my, you know, I don't even know it's so many. Like, endless. I, for me, it's how much time do I have to the very last moment where I have to turn in my homework. I just keep redoing it until I get, keep looking at it. Um, maybe 15 to 20? I, yeah, honestly, it's um, like think of five years, seven years. I, I do as many as I can. And what that does is um, it allows me not to be precious. You know when you draw? I learned it from drawing and animation. It's 24 dra drawings every second. So you, you throw out a few seconds, you've thrown out a week's work, and we just do it all the time. So I got in the habit of just going, oh, I just want to try this. And it takes the pressure off. If you like to draw, you like to tell stories, take the pressure off. Just write, 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 and um, that's you know, throw out that drawing. So I honestly, countless drafts, as many as I can. I don't see it as a bad thing. I see it as the best way to tell stories. Yeah, it was easily 50 for me, easily. And um, I really hope it's not 50 for the next book. But I, um, yeah, it's, um, it's a process. And, um, and, and like Alan said, I think, you know, don't feel like um, that's a bad thing. Uh, you know, it's, it's really, you know, and some books, and this is the first book I've written, and so, you know, I'm sure some books take less drafts than others, and I'm sure the more books you read, the maybe the less you have to do. You could probably speak more to that. You've written a few. I have, and, and everybody's, everybody's writing process is very, very different. Um, I write very slowly. Um, I kind of thump out each word, and then I'll go back and I'll delete it, and then I'll thump out some more words. So actually, rather than doing a lot of drafts, I just take a lot of time um, with my words. But then when I, when I feel like I'm ready to give it to my publisher, um, then it goes through a whole new process and you're working with somebody else with your words. And that, that will go back and forward maybe three or four times. So even though I think it's perfect, it's not at all. It never is. And uh, we're very lucky that we get to work with editors, like your teachers, who help improve your work. And sometimes it's hard to get those, uh, that feedback because you feel like, I think I've done a really good job already. But then if you take time, and um, it's always going to help your work. And so I really love that editing process when I have someone helping me with my work. And I really enjoy that. And that will take sometimes from six months to a year. To, to go back and forward. So it's, it's quite a long process. I want to go over to this side of the room now. Um, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Stand up. I have a question. There will be a signing, actually, in the, um, the lobby right afterwards. Yes. And I think they're just able to sign books, because then sometimes it's signing a shoe, signing a signing a, a piece of paper, signing a cough drop label, so. But I'll, I'll leave that to the folks out there, but I believe it is just a, a book signing. Anyone else with questions? Yeah, you right in the front here. What's your favorite animal? 
Favorite, now, a favorite color, favorite animal question. This side of the room is into the, into the favorites. Favorite animal as of this moment? Rabbit. Meerkat. My dog, Hannah. He's 12, <laughs> and I miss her. I've been away from her for two days, and I already miss her. Uh, any other questions? Let me see. Yeah, I want to try and get um, someone in the back over here. Uh, I think there's one in the very, very back. If you want to stand up and really use your diaphragm. Oh, interesting. This is a question about naming your characters. How do you decide on what to name your main characters? It's actually a really fun uh, part of writing, I find, is naming all the characters. And once you've written quite a number of books, as I have, you start to run out of names. Um, so, and often I'll, I'll, I'll assign names and then I'll go and change them because it just doesn't feel right. Because there, it is, a name is really important. Um, and it does, it makes a difference to your character, the name. So I, um, one of my favorite things to do is watch TV and movie credits um, to have a look at all the names. I go and visit lots of schools and uh, I see and hear lots of names in schools as well. Um, but I sort of, I, I collect them like, like a bird and um, hope to use them. I love I'll that answer, and movie credits, especially in older movies, too, it can vary, you know, or movies not made in North America, you can really expand your name repertoire. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll just add, too, if you think about the character that you're writing, say it's a villain, um, I'm writing a fairy tale uh, right now, and when there's a villain in it, and so you need a good villain name, or probably just go the opposite and just call them Steve or something, but if you want to be funny about it, but the villain I just named, her name is... Uh, Vanya von Weckworth, you know, and, and you know, whoa, that's a villain, right? You want to give the character something that reflects who they are. Um, and how did I come up with that? I, I searched the internet, you know, that's, uh, there you go. You can look, the internet's incredible. It's got everything there. You can like, what, give me good names, you know, and you find one that's like, that's the name. It'll, it'll, it'll sort of pop out and say, that's the one. You'll know it when you see it. How did Ava get her name? Ava, it ha has a little meaning if you look it up there. Um, might have something to do with birds. Again, mm -hmm. I'm just so obvious, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, and I would say with villains, you can also, as a writer, just thinking if you want to do it as a job, someone in your life, your brother, who's, you don't want to punish and want to name them the there villain. There you go, yeah. That's a good idea, too. <laughs> you can have some fun, you can have some fun there. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna, I want to try and pick somebody who is not right in my side. I'm going to go very, very back. Um, there's somebody in the middle in the very back, and I think a light-colored shirt if you want to stand up. Yes, go ahead. How do you choose your characters' personalities, or, or how do you go about, I guess, figuring out their personality? And not just write yourself, I would imagine. <laughs> Go ahead, Aaron. I have one quick note about that uh, as I'm writing uh, the story right now. It's a little tip for when you're writing. Make your most interesting character the main character. And that may sound obvious, but when you're writing stories, sometimes it doesn't turn out that way. Sometimes you make all the surrounding supporting characters super interesting, and then the main character is just somebody walking through going, oh, look at all these interesting characters, you know? <laughs> And, um, you know, so, so give, the, give your main character the most interesting personality, and that being the most complex personality. A uh, little tip. My, all my stories are uh, character-driven stories. So uh, it's more about the emotions of what the characters are going through rather than the, the drama and the plot. So uh, for me, it's easy because I'm, I'm already thinking about their, um, how the character is feeling, and therefore it really informs what kind of person, person they are and their personalities. So that's where I really, it's a great question, because that's where I, the character is where I start in any story, in how they feel. Very, very similar process, you know, it's partly, you subconsciously taking um, references from your own life, whether you like it or not, it's your own experience, right? So a lot of it's what you experience and then, and then voicing that. Um, and then the character becomes their own. 
um, they have to do their own, they're on their own journey and they, they, they evolve, I guess is what I'm saying. It takes me a while sometimes to learn who my character is. It's like a friend that you're having a relationship with. And um, they start, they start, you know, this is where I get, I get embarrassed. Like you really believe in those characters at a certain point. You start, you start understanding them, they, they become close friends. All right, I think we have time for one last one. I'm gonna go up here in the far corner. Yeah. Mm. Oh, this wow. is a banger for the last one. What is the most difficult piece of feedback you've ever received on your writing? And how did you deal with it? Please don't flip a table uh, <laughs> to reenact okay. any reactions. So, so the thing is, um, when you put something out into the world, if, uh, a book, it's not everyone's going to like it. Um, there's some people who are going to like it, but there's always going to be, you can't please everybody. And you learn that very quickly as an author, that um, not everybody is going to like your book. And that take, so you've got to develop a little bit of a thick skin and know that, you know, everyone has different um, likes and dislikes of what they like to read. There's not one size fits all when it comes to a book. So um, that's a really... Good advice for you guys starting out. Don't worry, not everyone's gonna, I hate to tell you, not everyone's gonna like it. <laughs> and, and as an author, you get, you get used to that. And you focus on, on the people who do like your book and, and the fact that they want to engage with you and, you, and you like, they, they like your book and forget about the other ones. Well, you know, I think, um, like I'm still learning how to deal with that. I'm 52. <laughs> And um, I think, you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing uh, because, you know, you really care about these stories and it's, they're very personal and, and your work is very personal to you. So, so it, can, it can be difficult when you hear criticism. Um, and, and often, you know, for every 10 compliments, you hear one criticism and that's all you think about, right? So I think, I think it's really important to remember, hey, wait, what about all those other nine people who liked it? Who thought it was good, you know? Don't focus on the one negative. I think that can help. I, I was going to suggest voodoo dolls and all sorts of things, but uh, yeah, that's good too. Just be really nice and grown up about it. <laughs> I think that actually brings us to the end of our time together. Please help me in giving a huge thank you to Alan, Aaron, and Michelle. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us at the Vancouver Writers Fest. A reminder that books are for sale and our authors will be available to sign your books in the venue lobby. And please complete your feedback survey later today. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a Thank wonderful you, rest of your day. I guess I will be able to say goodbye quickly to you up here. Can you imagine? I was like, no goodbyes.